Amen. God bless you all this morning. Let us all stand and let open our service with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are indeed grateful to be in your house this morning. Father, Lord, to gather ourselves together to sing your praises this morning, Father, and Lord, most of all, to be able to hear your word. Lord, we just ask that you'd be with us in our song service this morning, Father, and anything that's done and said, Lord, may it be glorifying to you. Be with Brother Brian, move him himself, help him to move himself aside, Father, this morning, that you would truly speak to us this morning, Father, and help us to grow in that image that you would have us to be in. And we ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> if you have an only believe book, we'll sing number 612, As the deer panteth for the water. <clears throat> As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. For you alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone does my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You are my friend, and you are my brother, even though you are my king. I want you more than any other, so much more than anything. For you alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone does my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee. I want You more than gold or silver, only You can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. For you alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone does my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire and I love. To worship Thee. Amen. This time we'll take our prayer request to the Lord this morning. <clears throat> Does anyone have a prayer request they'd like to make known? Amen. Remember Brother Joshua Gatchel this morning. Any other spoken prayer requests? <clears throat> Yes, uh, Sister Rhoda had her baby this morning. Yeah. So remember them in prayer. Uh, and uh, Brother Nate's pretty wore out. He think he did like a normal 30-hour marathon coming home last night from Australia. So he'll be here tonight with us for communion. But remember him in prayer that God would give him some rest. Uh, that's all I know to make an announcement for. <clears throat> Also, continue mother, uh, Brother John Shaw's mother for her continued healing. Continue to remember Brother Collins' family, the Dolly family, for healing uh, of the heart. And then Brother uh, John McRae, Brother Joe White, Brother Brian Chips, Brother Caldwell, Brother Frongus, and Brother Mabuka in Congo. Those are all healing for the body. Uh, also for the needs that are in India and also in Uganda. And I'm sure a lot of countries over there, I know Uganda's kind of in a little bit of a, or I, is that right? Yeah, Uganda with their leader wanting to change the constitution so he can stay in power for more years and just, uh, you know how it goes, a little bit of a power struggle. So remember our brothers and sisters over there in prayer. 
all our unspoken prayer requests this uh, morning can be known by an uplifted hand, and we'll go to the Lord with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are humbled this morning, Lord, that we can be your children, Father, Lord, your sons and your daughters, and Lord, we just look forward to the time that you would call us home, Father, but for now, Lord, we are here on this earth, Lord, and with ailments to the bodies and ailments to the mind and to the heart, Father, Lord, we ask that you would just grant each one of these requests that we've mentioned this morning, Lord, may they just be uh, healed, Father the ones that are needing healing in their body, and Lord, of those for that need healing in their heart, Lord, may you just grant that to them this morning. And for the lifted hands this morning, may you grant those requests to us as well, Father. And Lord, you know our hearts, Father. And Lord, we put our, our trust and our faith in your word, Father, this morning. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> Number 591, Who I Am. <clears throat> Oh, victory, that day he set me free and made my heart his very throne. My life is no longer mine, I'm a prisoner of love divine. And now I live to praise his name. Who I am, Lord, oh, who I am. All I can see now, just who I am. A part of my Savior, a part of His world, it's a revelation, it's predestination of who I am. On Calvary He died. To redeem thy lost bride, the King of kings became my Savior. This is God's great mystery of his love expressed to me that Christ and I might be made one. Who I am, Lord, oh, who I am, oh, I can see now just who I am. A part of my Savior, a part of his world, it's a revelation, it's predestination of who I am. Amen. Glad to start realizing who we really are. Amen. Brother Branham said when we did, we'd, we'd be out of here. Amen. Uh, Brother Christian, it was said that he wanted to do a song this morning, so we'll have him come at this time, and it's also good to have his brother here with us, uh, his Brother Gideon. <clears throat> Glad to be here. Uh, last year has been good. The Lord has been good to us. Amen. Uh, the Lord protected us, kept watching our lives, provided food for us. And I told me, and he told me. So that is good. And I'm glad my brother joined us last year too. And, uh, this year, uh, we know God is going to see us through again. Uh, uh, we want to sing 29. That's our new year resolution. 
we are trusting God that he will help us. Amen. Amen. So now I am resolved. Amen. I am resolved no longer to linger down by the world. that last verse taught by the bible and led by the spirit amen that's how it's supposed to be in the end time and uh brother steve and uh brother nick would you mind giving him a hand this morning i don't have my other steve with me <laughs> we'll ask you to take up this ty- morning's tithing offering <clears throat> amen brother steve would you ask the lord's blessing this morning Amen. 
Let's uh, sing that uh, song, God is Good, all the time. <clears throat> God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good, God is good all the time. If you're walking through the valley and there's shadows all around, do not fear, for He will guide you. He will keep you safe and sound Cause He's promised to never leave you Nor forsake you And His word is true God is good all the time He put a song of praise in this heart of mine God is good all the time through the darkest night his light will shine god is good oh god is good all the time we were sinners so unworthy still for us he chose to die filled us with his Holy Spirit. Now he can stand and testify that his love is everlasting and his mercies they will never end. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. Amen. He truly is good to us. I wouldn't even want to imagine what our lives would be like if he wasn't in control. Amen. <clears throat> God bless you. Now let us all stand and we'll sing only believe as we ask Brother Brian to come this morning. <clears throat> only believe. Only believe. All things are possible. Only believe, only believe, only believe that all things are possible. Only believe, Jesus, your Jesus, you're here. All things are possible now that you're here. Jesus, you're here. Jesus, you're here. And all things are possible now that you're here. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear gracious Father, we humbly and reverently approach thy word this morning with all humility and subjection to it and to you. Believing, Father, that our days are numbered here on earth, but they're not numbered in the place that we're going. And so, Lord, we just ask that you'd be with us this morning. Help us to understand, Lord, in a little better way, <clears throat> how to prepare our faith or how to approach our faith knowing that without faith it's impossible to please you for you are a rewarder of them that diligently seek you so be with us this morning father 
Guide us and protect us in thy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we had a little newborn this morning. Did you mention it? Uh, did you mention it? Did you mention our newborn this morning? Okay, good. Yeah, well, praise the Lord. And, uh, <clears throat> this morning, we're going to continue in our study concerning faith. And uh, we're going to study the parable of Luke 13, verse 6 to 10, which deals with the barren fig tree. And it teaches us how to approach faith. But before I read, I would like to uh, just to note that most everyone who has ever preached concerning this parable have focused on the fact that this tree had no fruit. And so Jesus cursed the tree. And so, you know, people in their minds are thinking, well, there was no figs in the fig tree. But as we begin to study this, we're going to find out that's not exactly the case because it wasn't the season for figs. It wasn't the season for figs. And so they, they, <clears throat> they turn their thoughts on the scene where Jesus actually curses the fig tree, and they say he cursed it because it had no fruit. And so many a sermon have gone forth emphasizing the necessity to bear much fruit as though it is the essential thing to do. And without bearing much fruit, you may find yourself cursed. Now, I do not believe that this is what the parable is about for one minute. It may be true that the Bible does teach us that we should bear fruit, but I do not believe for one minute that the tree was cursed because it had no fruit, nor because it lacked fruit. And we'll see why uh, in just a moment as we turn to Luke chapter 13, and we're going to read from, begin reading from verse 6. He spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of, of his vineyard, Behold, these three days I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and, and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it in the ground? Now the word cumbereth is not used in our regular vocabulary, so we need to know what it means. And in our dictionary, it simply means uh, to underemploy or to underutilize the ground. So in other words, saying this tree is just taking up space. It could be used for something more fruitful. In other words, um, it's not giving back anything. Therefore, why keep putting our efforts into it? Let's not waste any more precious energies on it. And that's the same evaluation that every missionary must take when he spends energy and funding in certain regions of the globe. Is there fruit being produced in this region? Or is this just a waste of time and money because the people do not seem to be progressing in the word? But look what the husband he said. He said, and he answered and said unto him, Lord, see the Lord is looking down. He says, hey, you're wasting time, you're wasting energy, resources. But the husband man, that's the ministry. He says, Lord, let it alone this year also. In other words, let's give it another year. Till I shall dig about it and dung it. In other words, we need to fertilize this. Let's, add, let's apply some fertilizer to this ground and see if it'll produce anything. Let's see if this tree will produce anything. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. Now notice the compassion that the husbandman had for the tree. And notice the response of this husbandman uh, of, the tree, of the vineyard. He in essence is saying, Lord, there might be a reason why this tree is not producing fruit. Let's first do all that we can to fertilize it and create the right environment around it and then see if it will produce or not. Now, I believe that's exactly what the scripture's teaching is that the fertilizing is the teaching of the word. There's got to be doctrine because if there's not doctrine, it's not going to produce. You know, Brother Brown said a church without doctrine is like a jellyfish without a backbone. <clears throat> and he said a man without a doctrine is, doesn't have a ministry. Now, that's a very wise thing uh, that is said here because many times we expect people in the church to produce when they've not even been taught the basic principles of Christianity. Therefore, there are three points that make up this parable. Number one, the fig tree itself. Number two, the fact that the fig tree has no fruit. And number three, judgment awaits the results of the fig tree's ability to produce fruit. To begin with, let's examine point number one, the fig tree. Um, here we must ask ourselves, what is the significance of the parable being about a tree? Why a tree? Well, you go over to Psalm 1, it says, you know, that a righteous man is like a tree that's planted by the rivers of life, or rivers of water, right? But Brother Bram said from his unfailing words of promise, he said, but here's what Jesus was speaking to my most humble opinion, was 
that he said that this generation, in other words, the generation that saw the fig tree putting forth his buds, see, he said here, and, and, and when the fig tree is, uh, tree is begin, is tender and putteth forth its branches, uh, you say that summer is nigh. Likewise, see, when you see that all these things know the time, when you see all these three questions fulfilled, the time is at the door, that generation that sees the fig tree. Now, <clears throat> notice again, he's talking about summer and fig tree. Summer, fig tree. So he's given us a little understanding that the fig tree doesn't blossom in the springtime. It doesn't produce fruit in the springtime. It produces fruit around May. Okay? And we showed you a few weeks ago that a generation lives 70 years, and if perchance good health, there's 80 years. Psalms uh, 90, verse 10, the days of, the, of our years are three score and ten a score is 20 years, so three score plus 10 would be 70 years. And if by reason of, of strength, they be four score years. That's 20 times four equals 80. Yet, uh, is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Now, let's get back to what Brother Brown was saying. He said, the fig tree is always Israel. And when Israel goes back to her homeland and becomes a nation, that generation will not pass away until these things are all fulfilled. And Christian friends, tonight, in this great scruple in the scriptures that people think is scrupled, we're now living to see the very everything that he has said here is fulfilled. Just the next thing is for his coming. A little later on in the book of Luke, we find Jesus telling another parable of a fig tree as well in uh, Luke 21, verse 29. And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree, notice, behold the fig tree, and, all, and, and then all trees, making a distinction. Israel and then all men. Okay. When they now shoot forth, you see and, and, and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that, uh, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. <clears throat> Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Now, notice that Jesus is talking in a parable and he tells the people that when the fig tree, which uh, we know is represented in Israel because the, the country is identified with the fig trees, uh, that when this fig tree, Israel, is beginning to put forth its bud, which means uh, when it begins to produce the fruit it was meant to produce, then we know that the summer or the end is nearing. Again, in Matthew 24, 31, we read, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh, or summer is nearing. So likewise ye, when you see all these things, know that it is near, even at the door. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Now in this parable, we also are dealing with Israel because the, the, the fig tree represents Israel. Uh, that is her tree that grows everywhere throughout that country. And we know Israel was declared a nation or a state, the state of Israel, on May 14th of 1948. And therefore, 70 years from then would be May 14th of 2018. Now... I do not know if there are any significance to this date since May 17, 1963, that the Lord appeared in the cloud over Tucson. So the same time frame within just a few days. <clears throat> and this is also significant because a vindicated prophet told us that Noah entered into the ark on May 17th as well. And then the clouds came. The cloud came on May 17th. And then Noah entered the ark on the 17th. And then the clouds came. All right. Now on the wings of a snow white dove, Brother Brown said, Noah was given a sign as the brother just saying about it. Uh, God was displeased, and there was nothing going to stay his wrath. For he said, the day, of, the, the, the day you eat thereof, that day you shall die. And Noah had found grace with God, and had built an ark according to the instruction that he had given him. And he had been floated up, and I can imagine what happened in them days when he said this, this old man up in the hill, an old fanatic, uh, building an ark, saying it's going to rain. It never has rained, but it, Noah said it's going to rain anyhow. And, and, and then I know the day that he went in. And I think what, uh, what, can't, can't think of what uh, the day it was. Uh, I believe the 17th day of May. Noah entered into the ark and shut the door, and the clouds begin to come. And the rains begin to fall, the, the sewers begin to fill up, the, the fountains of the deep broke up, the springs all belched up their water. Finally, people got into their houses, climbed up, on, uh, climbed up, and the old ark sat right there, just the same. After a while, when enough uh, begin to get around it, she began to rise up higher and higher, and the people knocked at the door and they screamed, but it, it did no good. Noah could not open the door because God closed it. God's the only one that can open it. So, so is it uh, at our ark, Jesus Christ, God opened the door for us on Calvary. He'll close it just as sure as he opened it. 
All right. <clears throat> Again, we see in the book of Mark then this same parable being told in Mark 13, 28. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves. You know that summer is near. So ye in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the door. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass away till all these things be done. Now this brings us to the second point we want to speak on concerning fruit. Because Jesus is not speaking uh, of the fig tree, but he's speaking of the fig tree that has no fruit. And we see an episode in his life that is exactly uh, what this parable is all about. In Matthew 21 and verse 18 we read, Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. Now notice closely that this is the key to this scene in Jesus' life. He was hungry and so he noticed a fig tree and he went out of his way to get something to eat from this tree. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and he found nothing thereon but leaves only. And said unto it, Let no fig grow uh, let, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? And Jesus answering said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do that which is done to this fig tree, but also if you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou moved, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive it. <clears throat> now this is kind of, you know, this is, we're, we're talking about faith. And this is kind of a strange thing for Jesus to be saying because he had just cursed a tree and said it shall not, never produce any fruit. And then it began to wither. And he said, now if you have faith, you can do this too. And you think, you know, usually we think of faith as something positive, something life-giving, something, you know, and it's all, you know, and here he's saying, it works both ways. Faith can produce the results both ways. Blessing and cursing. All right? Now the question is, why did Jesus curse this particular fig tree? You might say, well, it's because it had no fruit on it. And yet we find the same parable told in several other places in Scripture, and the indication is that it was not yet the season for fruit to be on the tree. So we must ask the question, why did Jesus curse this tree? And in Mark 11 and 12, we read, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Notice again the story telling us he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if happily, he might find anything thereon. So it wasn't particular because, I'm, I'm going to let you know, this was not the time for figs. But he was hoping to find something on that tree that he could put in his mouth and eat. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Now, remember Romans 9. Why does God, why does, uh, you know, the, the, the pot says to the potter, why hast thou made me thus? Paul said, oh fool, don't you realize that God makes some to honor, some to dishonor? Now, the author of this book made special mention that it, it was not yet the season for figs, to be on the tree. And you think in your mind, why would God curse a fig tree that it wasn't seasoned to produce figs and he cursed it because it didn't have them? But that's not what the parable says. It says he was looking to find anything on that tree that he could eat. Now, you think, well, I mean, you eat figs from a fig tree. Well, just a minute. Before you can have a fig, you have to have a little pot. That little pod then produces the fig. So what was Jesus looking at the tr fig tree if it was not yet seasoned for figs to be therein? That's our question. For certain, it was not figs that he sought to eat because it wasn't the season for figs. The second thing we must ask is, if it was out of season for figs, then why did Jesus, uh, why did Jesus curse that tree to begin with? And Jesus answered and said unto him, No man eat fruit thereof henceforth forever. And his disciples, they heard it. Therefore, without knowing what it was that Jesus was looking for in that tree to eat, we will not understand why he cursed it. And, and notice, in the very same parable, he says, For it was not yet time for figs. It was not the season. All right? Now, Mark 11 and 19 says, And when he was come, out, uh, he went out of the city, and in the morning, and they passed, they saw the fig tree dried up, from the roots. 
Now we're getting closer to finding out why Jesus cursed this tree. It had to do with its roots. The curse dried up from the roots. Now, and Peter calling to remembrance saith unto them, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say to this mountain be moved, be removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall receive them. Now, Jesus is not telling them that they can go around and just start popping off and, and speaking those things, uh, and, and those things are supposed to happen just because they say so. What he's teaching them is about how to approach faith. You approach it believing. All right? Now, remember, Jesus did nothing unless the Father showed him first. We all know that very well. That's John 5.19 and 5.30. And, and that is the, always the key in our having faith and manifesting our faith to others. It's not what you want, but what God has shown you, that's what you want. Faith is a revelation. It's not an action. Okay? If faith is a revelation, then faith is based upon someone. It's based upon God revealing to you something. Therefore, has God made the promise or has God not made the promise? And that's where, you, that's where your faith is is based. Did God say it? Did he not say it? Now look, we all know it has not yet, uh, it was not yet the season for the fig tree to produce figs, right? Then the curse was not because there was no figs, there was no fruit, but the curse was for another reason. It was because this tree was not prepared to produce fruit, and I'm going to show you that in just a moment. Jesus was not just some simple man that went around showing off his power that he had received from the Father. There was a, a specific thing he was looking for in the tree, and when he did not find that certain thing, he knew that the tree was already cursed, and thus he could pronounce what God had already showed him. In his book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, written by Alfred Edersheim in 1883, it states, Around 1881, Edersheim was writing about Jesus thrusting his hand into the branches of the fig tree and withdrawing it without fruit. Putting a curse upon the tree, it occurred to Dr. Edersheim that Jesus uh, was, tried and, 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 uh, uh, was tried and crucified in the spring and that the fig tree did not bear fruit until the early days of summer. Edersheim was certain he had caught the Messiah in a poorly devised example. He put his pen away, packed his bags, and took a steamer for Liverpool uh, from Liverpool to the Holy Land. The time was spring. He could not write another line until he learned what Jesus had in mind. Now, that's research. All right. Now listen, he didn't hop on a plane and he was there in eight hours. He hopped on a steamer and it probably took him months to get there. After an exhaustive journey, he rode an animal from Haifa to Jerusalem, dismounted and looked for a fig tree. Finding one, he reached into the branches and drew out his hand and found he had a few, a few leaves from the previous autumn and some, uh, and, and some round gray substance. They looked like lozenges. Edersheim sought out several pedestrians until he found one that could speak German. He, uh, he was told that the little gray objects were edible, that travelers used them to postpone hunger until they could reach an inn. You see, you don't make a diet on figs or you're going to be, you know, you're going to have the results. Okay. The tree will not bear fruit in the summer. So the German scholar returned to Germany where he continued to write the life and times of Jesus the Messiah, which is an all-time classic. Notice there was something in there that quenched your, thirst, or quenched your hunger. Now, what I want to bring to your attention here is that it was not figs that Jesus was looking for. It wasn't fruit but fr fruit or evidence that this tree was capable of bringing forth fruit. In the book of Jeremiah, we're given a story that is an allegory that, which represents Israel and its people being typed with the fig. In Jeremiah, uh, the Holy Spirit speaks in uh, Jeremiah 24 and 1, The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord after that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jecon Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, and the, prince of Ju and the princes of Judah with the carpenters and smiths from the Jerusalem and had brought them to Babylon. One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe. And the other basket had very naughty figs, which uh, could not be eaten, they were so bad. 
Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs, the good figs, very good, and the, e and the evil, very evil, that cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Like these fig, good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. And I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them up again to this land, and I will build, uh, build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. And I will give them in a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. For they shall return unto me uh, with their whole heart, and as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Surely thus saith the Lord, uh, so will I give Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes, and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land, and them that dwell in the land of Egypt, and I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt, to be a reproach and a proverb, and a taunt and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. Now, this brings us to the fruit itself. In, Je in the book of James 3 and 12, we read, Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh. In other words, the fig is a result of the nature of the plant. By their fruits you shall know them. Every seed after its kind. In other words, we are to bear what we are ordained to bear. Every seed must bring forth after its own kind or nature. Therefore, by our nature, we, uh, we bear what we bear, and we cannot bear anything other than what we are made to bring forth. Therefore, we must look at the fig, uh, at the fruit, to know the significance of this parable. We must also understand that God doesn't go around cursing for no reason. God gave us and spelled out very strong reasons for being cursed in Deuteronomy chapter 28, the book of two laws. He also spelled out the reasons for being blessed. Now, it is not as though God has two laws, but the two laws are the law of blessing and the law of cursing. And it all boils down to one thing, your respect to the word of God. If you respect the word of God, you'll be blessed. If you don't show respect to the word of God, you won't be blessed, you'll be cursed. All right. So how we respond to the voice of God, if we hearken to it, we're blessed. And that is the blessing will come upon us. And before we are fully aware of what is happening, it will overtake our situation. In Deuteronomy 28 and 1, we read, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set, upon thee, uh, set thee high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy, body, of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies uh, that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way, and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessings upon thee in thy storehouses, and in all that thou settest thine hand unto. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways, and all the people of the earth shall see uh, that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, and the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of the cattle, and in the fruit of the ground, and in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto, unto thee his good treasure, the heavens, to give rain unto the land in the season, and to bless all the work of thine hands. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above, above only, and thou shalt not be beneath. If that thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day, to the right hand or to the left, uh, to go after other gods to serve them. Now I want you to notice that for every single blessing that God blesses us with, he has also promised that every circumstance that we are being blessed in, God has also set a curse in those same very things as well, but it all depends on your attitude towards the voice of God. Deuteronomy 28 and 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, 
to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these things shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So notice, he says, in order to hearken, you've got to not only observe, but you've got to do. Hearing, recognizing, and then acting upon the word of God. All right, that's what Brother Brown taught us. He said, cursed shall thou be in the city, and cursed shall thou be in the field. All right, you were blessed in the city, blessed in the field. Now it's cursing in the city, cursed in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. We saw all the blessings already. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, the fruit of the land, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep. We saw exactly the opposite, if you honor the Lord. Cursed shall thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord sh uh, shall send upon thee cursings, vexation, and rebuke, in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do until thou be destroyed and until thou perish quickly because the wickedness of thy doings where, uh, whereby thou hast forsaken me. Okay. Now I'm going to stop short of reading the entire chapter for time's sake. But you can read it for yourself to see that the same things we are blessed in can be cursed in also and it all depends on how we show respect to the voice of the Lord our God. Now then it's not your fruit that brings on the curse and it is not what you do or do not do that brings on a blessing or a curse but it is your attitude and respect or your lack of respect that you have towards God and his word so putting fruit bearing aside putting um, you know, your thoughts of works aside it comes right down to the attitude as Martin Luther said if the things that you do doesn't come from the heart God looks at it as though you're not even doing it so it comes right down to here, right down to your heart, okay? <clears throat> so that is what the Apostle Paul also teaches in Romans 9.16. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Now, how did God show his power? Well, first of all, Pharaoh argued every time Moses came to him. Pharaoh argued, all right? Then, after being cursed and having a plague come, then he capitulated, and he said, okay, okay, you can go. Then God gives a, a period of time in between, the hardening process, God gives a period of time in between for him to say, you know, look, they forgot about the boils, they forgot about the flies, they forgot about the frogs, it's all in the past. So this is not just, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, and you're out. It was like a period of time, a season. Could have been years, we don't know. Could have been uh, two or three years, I don't know. But it was a season where God would bring the hardening, then he'd soften it. Bring the hardening, and then he'd soften it. And their attitude got worse and worse and worse. So it was the attitude. Because, look, every time they capitulated, they could say, well, see, I'm doing what God wants me to do. I'm, I'm letting him get, you know, you can go, Moses, you can go, Moses. Hey, look, the world turns very slowly. And politics turns very slowly. You know, the changes we're seeing today are the most rapid we've seen. The last 16 years was devastatingly slow. We're th seeing things speed up a little bit, but it's still, it doesn't happen overnight. It's taken a year just to get where we're at, and they're just starting to soften some of the people in Congress up now to go to do a few things. So when you're dealing with numbers, you just can't herd two million people out of a city in an hour, in a day. I mean, you think of two million people coming out of a particular city at rush hour, and you're driving in cars you know, it takes hours. Some, some people tell me in New York and Los Angeles, it's taking two hours to commute every day, each way. Each way. And you're not moving two million people. You're probably moving because they've got eight-lane highways. You're moving maybe a half a million people in this direction, a half a million in this direction. <clears throat> Try moving two million people on foot. Just go to Costco on a Saturday, and you know what I'm talking about. People stop to get the, the uh, little refreshment, and everybody's got to stop behind them because it's just packed. It's just incredible. Got to go at a different time, right, John? <laughs> All right. So notice he says, for even this reason I raised up Pharaoh 
even for the same purpose I raised thee up, and I, that I might show my power in thee, and that my might might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he hath mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. And thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Sounds like uh, you know the apostles in their mind. Why did he curse this fig tree when it's not even the season to produce figs? See? Thou wilt then say unto me, Why dost thou yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one a vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, who is willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath that had fitted themselves to destruction? And what if he did that to make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory? In other words, what if God allows darkness of night in order to show forth the brightness and splendor of the day? What if he allows bad people in order to show forth those that are good? What if he allows storms and rain in order to bring forth fresh, uh, freshness after the rain? You know how good the air smells after the rain and lightning? Well, God doesn't do things for no reason at all. As Solomon said, there is a purpose and a season for everything God does under the sun. God is very exact in what he does and has a purpose for everything he does under the sun. Ecclesiastes 3 and 1, to everything, everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. In other words, a harvest time and a season. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. You know, our generation has gotten so out of tune with God's word that they think every day should be a time for laughter. Every day should be, t you know, the good times should be coming all the time. And they're not prepared to handle even an insult. They can't take it. They melt down. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. Talk to anybody that's really made it financially and they'll tell you. They, 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 they made it and they lost it. They made it and they lost it. They made it and they lost it and finally they made it. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. But the person that never is willing to venture out, he saves what little he has but he doesn't invest he's not willing to take that chance and the Bible says it's life is full of chances a time to love a time to hate a time of war a time of peace God has a purpose behind everything so what is the purpose of the tree being cursed because that tree could not be cursed unless it was first cursed in heaven and that is the key to our prayer and our faith Acknowledging what God has already done, Jesus knew that tree was already cursed because it didn't even have the foundations for figs and could not bring forth fruit even before the season and thus then uh, could speak those words of curse to it because it had already come under a curse and the fact that it did not have in it the essentials to be able to produce a desired fruit <clears throat> is why it would be cursed. The curse is not because of what it did or did not do. The curse is done in heaven and then just spoken or acknowledged on earth. Our words declare what God has already pronounced. So point number two, the fruit. First, we must understand the fruit shows that there is life in the tree. Therefore, without any fruit, there is no representation of life in it to begin with. Then, therefore, all you have remaining is just a form. And Jesus warned us that in the end time, people would have a form of godliness, godlikeness, but would deny the power thereof, and the power is the manifestation of the revelation. In Romans 1 and 16, we read, the word of God is the power of God unto salvation. Therefore, we see in point number two that the fruit is an indication that the tree is producing something for someone, and it is good for something. No fruit shows that it is of no use to others, but just taking up space and getting in the way. That is why Jesus said in, the, in, in getting back to Luke 13 and 7, why cumbereth it in the ground? Or why let it take up good ground when it is not utilizing what the ground has to offer? 
Why in the mission field would you pour out time and energies and money and this and that if there's no fruit coming forth from that place? Now, a lot of people go to locations and claim to be doing the missionary work, and they have no fruit for what they're doing. They're going for a vacation. You know, in, in the, uh, uh, ant, uh, the, the um, pre-Nicene fathers, I believe it was, um, not Irenaeus, it was the next one. Um, anyway, he said, um, if, if a missionary claims that God sent him and he stays for more than three days after he's completed his work, he said God didn't send him. He went there for a vacation. Now, he didn't use the word vacation. He used another word, but same thing, you see. And I wonder sometimes if, 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 it, if he doesn't think the same thoughts today concerning people in Laodicea that are just lukewarm, concerning Christ and concerning service in his kingdom. God put us on earth for a purpose, brother, sister, not just to do, go to go to your job, not just to produce an income for your family. That's that's part of what you have to do. You have to plant the potatoes. But God put us on earth as a lighthouse, as a witness to the great things that he has done. Now, point number three, the fruit represents the teaching for the season. This is very important because when he reached in to see what the fruit it had, there was not teaching there at all, no fruit at all. And without any teaching, which is doctrine, the tree is fit for just one thing, and that's firewood. In other words, a church of people without doctrine is fit only for destruction and the fire of the tribulation period. Now, that's true. There's many parables on that. I could, I, we could take a whole day and do that. Now, from a sermon, anointed ones at the end time, Brother Branham said, now notice, it's what they produce that tells you the difference. By their fruit, Jesus said, you shall know them. Uh, man does not gather grapes off of a thistle, even though the thistle be right in the vine. That could be possible, but the fruit will tell it. What is the fruit? It's the word for the, the fruit for the season. That's what it is. They're teaching. The, uh, the teaching of what? The teaching of the season. What time is it? Is it man's doctrine, denominational doctrine, or God's word for the season? Therefore, he said, by their, by their teaching of the season, by the fruit, you will know whether they are God's seed or not, by what they're teaching that this message is. By what, by what they teach that the message for the season is, do they just point you to a man or to the God who came down and used that man? Presence. Proves you. Do they just point you to tapes or do they point you to what is taught on those tapes? Do they make the prophet of the hour the son of man? Or do they just say, as he said, that the prophet is just a son of man revealing the son of man? Do they point you to William Branham or do they point you to the one William Branham was pointing you to? Do they point you to a man or are they pointing you to the God of the man? For Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. And William Branham said that means by what they are teaching for the message of the hour, you will know them. Now we have in Christianity what we call nominal Christians, which are people that go to church, pay their dues, their tithes. You know, they call it dues in the nominal church. And produce nothing. They don't produce any life of Christ. They don't produce a life that is filled and a mind that's filled with the word of God. They produce things for the church. The message is filled with churches the same. They can tell you God sent a prophet. You ask them what did he teach. They stumble. They're lost for words. They might bring up a couple doctrines like serpent seed and Maybe uh, no eternal hell. That's about as far as they come. They really have no clue of the day and the season of which the message tells us. By their fruits you shall know them. By what they teach is the message for the hour you will know them. Now from a sermon, Invasion of the USA, Brother Brown said, I sometimes I think of my ministry and I see people come and I get into the hotel room and say, God, who's the people coming to see, me or you? See? If they're coming to see me, they're lost yet. 
If this message is all about William Branham, you, you people are lost. It's about God. It's about God. The one, he says, but, uh, um, if they're coming to see me, they're lost. But, oh God, tear me down and take me away. I want to respect you. The one who will stand before us someday with trembling hands and trembling feeb feeble body looking at you, knowing that my soul hangs by your decision. Let us exalt Christ. <clears throat> As Brother Vale said, when God came in the room, when he was with Brother Branham, he said, I didn't see it. Brother Branham turned to me and, and, and uh, God had appeared in the room to show Brother Branham he's to go west. Brother Branham turned to Brother Vale and said, did you see him? He said, no, but I saw one who did. He said, Brother Branham's whiskers stuck straight out. He looked like a scared animal, like a hunted animal. That's how fearful Brother Branham was in the presence of God. When Moses came down and his face glowed with the Shekinah presence of God, the people were fearful. They said, put a mask over, put a veil over your face. We don't want to see God. Who just look at the man? Brother Ram always saying, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. Now in closing, let me just say, share a few quotes that the Stark family sent. I don't know if it was you or your wife in a, in a text this week, but it was a very good quote from... You must be born again. He said, Into the presence of the living God we come now, soberly, and in the fear of him, we come in the name of the Lord Jesus, knowing that we could not come and, uh, uh, that we could not come and saying, Now, Father, here is William Branham, or Armand Neville, or whoever it, we might be. We would be turned down quickly. Right quickly. But we have the assurance that he said, If you ask the Father anything in my name, it will be granted. So I don't guess that I could, using my name, get anything from him. Then why are people praying in William Branham's name all over the world? When he himself said, I couldn't even go to him in my own name and expect to get anything. But I know that when I use his son's name, then I get my petition, for it's in him that I trust. It's in him that we live and have our being and we're grateful this morning, God, for all that he means to us, and, that, and that's our complete life and being. Now hopefully, you'll have understood that this sermon was to help us to understand how that we are to approach faith. And there's only one faith, and that is the faith of the Son of God, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ, because there's only one faith and one Lord, and it's the one faith of that one Lord. And if we approach God in any other way than through his Son, we can be pretty much guaranteed we will not receive anything from the Lord. In Romans 5 and 1, we read, Therefore, being justified by faith, by revelation, we have peace with God through William Branham. Is that what it says? Levell, is that what it says? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom? Jesus Christ. We have access by faith into the grace wherein we now stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of the doxa of God of the very opinions, values, and judgments of God. Ephesians 3.11 According to the eternal purpose that he purposed in Christ, Jesus our Lord, in whom, who's, who's talking about? Jesus Christ our Lord, we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. It's not by the faith of William Branham. Doesn't say so. Doesn't say it's by the faith of Paul. By the faith of Jesus Christ. Access by the faith of who? He's talking about Jesus Christ. And we have access through the faith or revelation of Jesus Christ, not revelation of William Branham or who he is, because he even said of himself in influence, he said, if you want to find out how great you are, put your finger down in a pool of water or a bucket of water, then pull your finger out and try to find where you put your finger. You are nothing. You're nothing. God can do without you. He can do without me. But we can't do without him. We've got to have him, for he is life, and he alone. Not to know his book, not to know the... Listen, that's really good. Not to know his book, can I add, not to know the tapes, 
not to know this or know that or know the creed, but to know him is life. To know him as a person. Christ in you, the word may flesh in you. That's knowing him. When you and he becomes one, like I said the other night, this super sign, he's got to come into you, you, God and man must come become one. You're conscious of your littleness. From influence, he said, now, they had two wings over their feet, speaking of the uh, cherubims. What was that? Humility in his presence. Moses took off his shoes in the presence of God. The angels put their wings across their feet in the presence of God. Paul fell down to the ground. He kissed the ground as it was. He was in the presence of God. <clears throat> when I worked for the Japanese in two different companies, I learned that you don't put your feet up on something that's level with them. It shows disrespect. All right? So your feet has a lot to do with your respect. Paul, Moses took off his shoes. Paul fell to the ground to worship. The angels covered their feet. All right? Notice, it all shows humility. And he was in the presence of God. John the Baptist said, I'm not even worthy to loose the, sh the, the sandals on his feet, the shoes on his feet. Wings over their feet, humility. Watching where they walk, what they do. Realizing they're on holy ground. Oh, if we would do that, we'd never walk in these places that's wrong. We'd never do things that's wrong. Now, notice always, listen, be conscious of your littleness. Who are you? Stick your finger in a bucket of water and pull it out and find the hole that, you're fi that, 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 that you put your finger in. Then say, that was me. You're nothing. You'll not be missed after a, a, little, while, a, a, a little while after you're gone. They'll have a funeral possession out there and that's all, but your influence will live on and on and on. And from my little Bethlehem, he said, now, one of my little girls was asking the other day about imp importancy. And I said, well, talking about some important man, why, it was the president that had just been assassinated and our hearts was grieved over it. And I said, well, he was an important man. And the papers played it up and the television shot it and billions and billions and billions of dollars it cost the government to broadcast that, which that's all right. That's their business. But, but I said, this little Pentecostal preacher up there in Carolina, that a man walked in, a drunk with his shotgun, called for his wife, and shot the man plumb out of the pulpit, then shot his wife and shot himself. A little piece in the back of the paper about that big. Let me tell you, brother, no matter who you are, you want to know how important you are? I said to my little girl, stick your finger in a bucket of water and pull it out, and the hole that you left is how much shows you how much God needs you. And he said, then try to find the hole. We are nothing. There's only one important, and that is God. We must remember that He is the one. He said, I will have no other God before me. Now just remember and never forget what the Apostle Paul told us concerning our relationship with God. He said in Hebrews 11 and 6, but without faith, <clears throat> and there's only one faith, and that is the faith of, the, of that one Lord, and since faith is the revelation, therefore we can read this, without the revelation of Jesus Christ, it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that God is, and that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And in closing, I'd just like to read again from Matthew 10, verse 41. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. You know, I hear that, and I've heard that all across the country. I've heard that quote very much in this message. But you never hear the other half of that which says, And he that receiveth a righteous man, a rightly wise man, in the name of a rightly wise man, shall receive a rightly wise man's reward. Now, we can all name the prophet. But can we all name a rightly wise man? You had better receive the rightly, man, rightly wise man in his name if you wish to receive his reward. And the rightly, man, the rightly wise man is the one who has been faithfully taught. Brother Brown said in his book, Church, Seven Church Ages, he said, uh, in every age we have exactly the same pattern. That is why the light comes through some God-given messenger in a certain area, and then from that messenger there spreads the light through the ministry of others who have been faithfully taught. Prophet, you receive the prophet, you receive prophet's reward, you receive the righteous man who's preaching what the prophet said, you're going to receive the same reward.
There's your pattern. Matthew 10, 41. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive the prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man receiveth a righteous man's reward. Now listen. He said, you must receive the prophet in the name of that prophet. So if you cannot receive the, what William Branham taught and identify it with the man William Branham, you're not receiving, you'll not receive a prophet's reward. Because you've not received what the prophet taught in the name of that prophet. There are a lot of men who try to teach some of the things William Branham taught, but give no credit to who brought it. And so they teach without any acknowledgement of the prophet by name. Then, though they teach some of what he taught, they will receive nothing of his reward. And he also said, you must receive the rightly wise man in the name of a rightly wise man. And let me just say, Brother Vale was a rightly wise man. And he was a rightly wise man. And if you, if you cannot receive that righteous man in the name he came with, Lee Vale, you will not receive what that righteous man's reward. Now, I know ministers combing the earth who are teaching doctrine that Brother, Bra Bro Brother Vale taught, but they won't even use his name in their own church even because there's a stigma to that name. Just as you go out amongst the Pentecostal churches and you use the name William Brown, there's a stigma to that name. But you identify with that prophet and what he taught, you receive that prophet's reward. You identify with that rightly wise man, Lee Vale, and what he taught, you receive that righteous man's reward. As I said, there are a lot of people who try to teach what Brother Vale taught, but they stay clear of ever identifying with the man, and they will not receive the reward associated with that righteous man either. I've always identified myself with his ministry. And that of Brother Branham because the light came to the prophet and Brother Vale was faithfully taught by William Branham. And then he mentored me and I was faithful to shut up and listen. And then not just stop there, but ask him to identify scriptures with the things that he taught so that I could faithfully then teach others. And to me that scripture where Jesus says, He that receiveth the prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. To me, to receive the name of the prophet and the name of a righteous man is, is like the pre-fruit of the fig tree. You say the name William Branham, that's the pre-fruit. I say, okay, what did he teach? What he taught was the fruit, the figs. But the pre-fruit is the name. Just like the name Lee Vale. Okay, people want to disparage it. That's that little lozenger like he used to pop all the time. Right? The pre-fruit. So what did he teach? That's the fruit. You understand? Okay. The little gray objects in the fig tree, the pre-fruit that the travelers used to eat to postpone hunger. And when you receive what a prophet teaches in the name of that prophet, it takes you to the fruit, which is Christ. And then you receive the righteous teaching of the righteous man, it takes you to Christ, the fruit. The fruit of it all. From a sermon, God in simplicity, Brother Bram said, when a minister walks into the congregation of praying, of a congregation of people praying in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you're bound to hear from heaven. That's just all. There's no way to keep from it. But if you walk into confusion, then you're so confused the spirit is grieved. Well, what's confusion in the church? It's disrespect for the sanctuary. It's disrespect for the house of God. It's disrespect for the minister that's coming forth to preach. But he says, but if you have that respect, you're going to hear from God. Brother Bram said in Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He said, now notice, if Jesus did, did those things in that day and he raised from the dead, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he's obligated to his word. Now, his corporal body sits at the right hand of God. You believe that, don't you? But the Holy Spirit is here working through his sanctified vessels. That's an S on there. Notice this is plural here. And God has said in the church, what? First apostles, then prophets, then teachers, then evangelists and pastors. Is that right? For the perfecting of the church. God has did it. It's not the preacher that preaches. It's God preaching through him. It's not the prophet that sees visions. It's God speaking through him. 
I do nothing except the Father show me first what to do. Then when you disrespect the true fivefold ministry, you disrespect the God who's using the vessels. You disrespect William Branham, prophet of God, you're disrespecting God. You disrespect Lee Vale, righteous man, rightly wise man, you're disrespecting God. That's just it. From Jesus on the authority of the word, that shows that the little gray lozenge isn't there. It comes down to respect, brother, sister. Oh, yeah. Respect. Brother Ram said, from Jesus on the authority of the word, he said, always be reverent during the time of service, especially when the healing service is going on. Be open-hearted, open-minded. Just say, now, Lord, I'm here to learn. You come teach me, see? And the Holy Spirit will teach you. If you come with a kind of a sarcastic criticism, whatever you expect to see, that's just what you'll see. If you come expecting to be just disappointed, that's, that's the way. You'll, you'll get what you expect always. If you come to receive, you'll be expecting to receive, and, and you shall receive just what you expected to receive. God always does that. He's sworn to his word. And now maybe some things might be said that we could just uh, be a little different from your religious teachings. You might be Catholic or you might be something other than uh, 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 some other phase of religion or some, some Protestant that doesn't, believe, uh, that doesn't believe in divine healing, whatever it is, you look at it just that way. Just look at it from the standpoint of God's word. I'll add another name here, Brother Collins. He was a righteous man. He lived it. His life was lived it. People didn't respect that man. They're not going to receive that man's reward. That man respected the prophet. He'll receive the prophet's reward. Brother Vale respected the prophet. 85% of what he taught was pointing to the ministry of William Branham and God in that ministry. You respect that, you, you, you receive God's reward. Matthew 10, 41. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. That's why I've entitled this faith number 57, faith in God's fivefold ministry, number four, and how to approach that faith. And it all comes down to respect. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we want to thank you for your word and for your, your opening up to us, Lord, our approach to thee with honor and respect. You said blessed will be if we hearken to the voice of the Lord our God. And we know that the voice of the Lord our God is not only his prophets, it's his righteous men. It's apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists and pastors. Because it's one voice. It's, it's, it's many waters, but there was one voice of the many waters throughout the ages, as we've proven by quotes and scriptures in the last few in this series. <clears throat> so, Father, we just pray that we would come to the place of just showing respect May we be able to disagree with a brother and still show respect for that brother. That's my prayer. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Just a chorus. Five o'clock tonight, communion service. Come expecting, Brother Justin will be speaking. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace <clears throat> Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful faith. 
And the things of this world Will grow strangely dim In the light of His glory and grace 